Cotabo has been around 30 years, and that's a lot of history to, to share in 30 minutes. So I'm going to hit some high points, but more importantly, I'm going to reflect on some perspective uh, on how my perspective and how our perspective on the experience has changed over time. But before I do that, I wanted to just run through the basics. For those of you who have not had uh, personal exposure to a bow, this is one. If you pass that one. That happens to be a base bow. Um, I'll pass this one around in the back here. This gentleman knows nothing about bows. This is Dawson Dawson, one of our highlights of our history. Um, and what you'll notice as you pass them around, it's a fairly simple object. It has, uh, it has a shaft, it has a frog, and it has what we call a ribbon. And the frog itself is that block. It slides, it tensions the ribbon, which is commonly horsehair, but with increasing frequency is going to be a synthetic material. And it's the ribbon that contacts the string on an instrument. And so obviously it's up to the player to manipulate the bow to excite strings on the instrument. And so is that important? Well, if you ask the players, it is. This is a very common perception in the industry. My instrument is my voice, my bow is my breath. When you think about that, imagine our vocal cords are our violin, and that our breath is the bow. You can't have any sound without the breath, and yet when you, when you listen to vocalists, it's, there's so much breath training. And so when a player says this, they're saying that this bow is really an intimate part of my experience. It's like my actual breath, uh, which is wonderful, but it places an incredibly high engineering challenge for all of us uh, in trying to understand exactly what that means for the player. But you can imagine when somebody finds the right bow, how much it means to them. Oops. <coughs> So what is Cotabo? I'll just hit the highlights of what it is today. It's the world's premier brand of performance bows. What does that mean? It means that there are more Cotabos. It's a, it's the, there are over 120,000 Cotabos out in the world in the hands of professionals and serious amateurs, making it the largest commercial professional bow company in the world. Uh, there are very few stages throughout the world that it doesn't occupy. It's in rehearsal halls. Uh, it is in uh, recording studios throughout the world, and it is still a small percentage of the overall market, which is predominantly wood. Um, we're recognized as the pioneers who used the first to use advanced materials in bows. We produce bows for violin, viola, cello, and bass, ranging in prices from retail $400 to $2,000. The two bows going around are roughly $1,500 to $2,000. Um, we do accept Venmo right here. If you're <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've received international awards for design. We currently occupy about 13,000 square feet uh, on the east end of town, and there are 25 gifted and talented teammates that work there. And since 2021, uh, Cotabo has been wholly owned by Nesna Ventures, which is a private equity firm based in La Crosse, the principals of whom are the founders of Quick Trip. Um, this is just a sample of some of the promotional material that we do. It's a short video I'll play for you. It's featuring the Marquee Experience, which is uh, our top end bow offering. You play in coffee shops. You practice. You rehearse. You perform. And you do this not only as a musician, but as an individual. Though your passion is shared, you are unique. Traveling a musical journey that is your own. 
The Marquee Experience honors you, the individual musician. It is about your tastes, about your journey. Whether choosing a standard professional bow or commissioning a master bow made just for you, your bow choice is personal. They're a reflection of you, a statement about your dreams. Through the marquee experience, let us bring your dreams to life in a way that only the most experienced makers and most advanced technologies can. Dare to dream. And let us craft the perfect bow for you. So that gives you a sense of, in the case of the Marquee Experience, the type of players that we're appealing to. It's a very personal choice, it's a very intimate choice, uh, and it's, uh, it's a very challenging objective to appeal to a broad spectrum of players. Uh, when we started, it was considered so unlikely as to be impossible, and it, it's validating that 30 years later, uh, a reputable, resource like Strings Magazine says, Codable may be the most revolutionary thing to happen to string playing since Francois Tort crafted the first modern bow 200 years ago. So uh, the adoption just happened overnight. These things just happened like that. <laughs> um, when Taft called and asked me to, to reflect on the story and to share the not just the Skittles and beer, but the other stuff, I started to reflect on the experience uh, at several levels. One is, as an early entrepreneur, when you're in the mix and, and, and things are just so frenetic and so crazy and you're just trying to get through each day and progress down the path. The other is, as a more experienced entrepreneur, at the, kind of the middle stage of a business. And then the last is uh, where I stand now where I am less involved in the business. And I wanted to share those perspectives with you because they reflect different aspects of the business that are worth appreciating. And together they tell the story. So if Taff had called me 20 years ago and said, hey, can you say a few words about the business? I would, the person on the other end of the phone would have been, uh, first of all, young, that's younger than I am. Um, they would have been unmarried, they would have been strong-willed, they would have been a believer in self-determination, and they probably would have presented the story um, as a simple timeline, a simple chronology to say, in 1959, Stan Prosen uh, was inspired by his experience with a carbon fiber ring, which is actually here. I can tell you a little more about that later. And it planted a seed of an idea that stayed with him for over 30 years. And he, though he had a very fulfilling career, he dabbled in it, played around with the idea on the side, trying to get it going, involved other engineers. Um, but it wasn't until 1993 that he bumped into a young engineer from Iowa uh, with whom he partnered, and together they created something the world hadn't seen yet and created a global brand. Um, in telling that story at that time, 20 years ago, I probably would have been inside my own head too much to, to acknowledge what might have really been going on. And I would have said, well, here are the milestones, here are the successes, and the lesson that we learn is if you work hard enough and have a good enough education um, and take the risks, you'll be successful at just ratcheting down this road. Well, that was somebody 20 years ago. Um, if, you, if Taff had called 10 years ago, he would have encountered a different entrepreneur. Somebody who had been in it a little longer, who was a little more humbled, who was now a husband and learned very quickly that you, know, you can't live inside your own head. You have higher, bigger responsibilities outside. Um, 
And if I were asked at that time to share the story, I would have shared something not so linear, not so predictable, and not so um, systematic. It would have been a story of, I would have called it a story of innovation. And the lesson there would have been, this is hard. This stuff is hard and you make lots of mistakes and you need to learn from your mistakes and you need to surround yourself with good people, ones in the audience, <laughs> and you need to um, rely on those people and at the end of the day, understand that it's not all about you and that uh, there's this thing called luck. There's this unknown <laughs> that plays a factor in it uh, and is mysterious in how it intersects with the, the story. And the innovation story can be, in telling that story, I would have told any number of things that were just, you know, could have been showstoppers. One was we predicated the entire line in those early days on a rare carbon fiber and launched the line, introduced it. We were getting lots of market traction, thinking we were the smartest people in the room and walked in on a Monday morning and there was a fax from the supplier, who was the only supplier of this material in the world. And they said, sorry, there's not enough global demand for this material. We're stopping production and there is no substitute. So it was a pretty bad Monday. <laughs> um, you know, in the tale I would also tell part of the innovation story is a, a tale of kind of oversight to say, you know, how could we have been so blind? You know, here we're creating something that the world had never done before. And we kind of overlooked that you can't just go out and buy a machine that makes it. So along with creating the product, you have to create this process. And so this kind of manageable problem became <laughs> just mushroomed. And uh, I can't tell you the thousands of trips we made to Ace and Fleet Farm and concepted <laughs> machines together out of wood and wire and duct tape just to test concepts so that we could ultimately make them what they are today, which is highly evolved, you know, state-of-the-art type of equipment. Um, and then finally, part of the innovation story was something that, uh, frankly, was just hubris. It was, it was arrogance on our part to think, okay, and this is two engineers talking, Stan and me, saying, okay, if you make a better product in this world and it, and it, it is a solution for a market, they will just flock to your door. <laughs> and the headwinds of tradition rage strong in this rendition. <laughs> and so it, it was very humbling to, to have this product, have this manufacturing, and then to realize that we were actually uh, despised by some and discouraged by a lot in those early days. Uh, but that was oversight on our part. But that, was, that would be the perspective of 15 years or 10 years ago. Taft called now, and when I picked up the phone, the entrepreneur that he got was considerably older. I've been married for 18 years. We have four wonderful children, and three are only here. Where's the fourth? <laughs> <laughs> Is that my job to remember where I was? <laughs> Sorry, honey. Um, I've largely trans transitioned out of the business. And I've had a few years to immerse myself in aspects, in the blessings of life, um, that went underappreciated and underserved while you're in the vortex of the business. And those are things like walking our kids to school, to and from school every day, or uh, having regular dates with my wife and going to Pilates classes. Doesn't show. <laughs> um, you know, taking family trips that don't involve dealer visits, uh, spending more time uh, appreciating the community that we have, um, and as of two years ago, having been confirmed, taking more time and being more serious about my faith life. So from that entrepreneur's perspective, looking back, and I look at the story, it's a story that I would probably call a story of yes moments. And what I mean by this 
is that I marvel at the sheer unlikeliness of the Code of Oath story. Taft suggested he couldn't believe it's here. I can't believe it's here. <laughs> um, it's a highly unlikely story. And when you go back and say, well, there were, it, it really shouldn't be here, let alone be successful. And when you go back, and, you, and, and I go back and reflect back on the moments, there are countless moments where somebody said yes under circumstances that didn't necessarily make sense, and they got involved and we benefited and they benefited in ways that we couldn't have imagined. And when you go back through the history of Kotovo, they're everywhere, they present themselves. And so that's the story that I feel compelled to tell. And I'd like to just share a few instances of that. Um, the first is up on the upper left, that's Stan and me. And the long story short is, Stan was inspired in 1958 uh, by carbon fiber. It was introduced to him by the actual inventor, Roger Bacon. And Roger came to Stan with just a small sample of this material. And Stan made this ring. He was a researcher at the Naval Ordnance Lab. And he made this ring so that they could quantify the uh, properties. And the properties were so mind-blowing that they just couldn't imagine a material being of this, you know, of this nature. Stan jumped up from his bench, all excited, ran down the hall to report the data, and dropped a ring. It hit the ground, it bounced up, it resonated, and Stan said it was at that moment he was intrigued by the acoustical properties of carbon fiber. The whole world has been fascinated by its structural properties, but it was right at the beginning that he was interested in acoustical properties. I learned all this because when I met Stan in 1993, we became friends right away. And we had regular lunches at the Acoustic Cafe. And we'd sit down and he'd share these stories. And one day he said, I've got a little more story to tell you. He said, there's a trunk. It's a green trunk. Dawson, you probably remember this. That's floated around most of his professional life that contains notes, and samples and, and uh, prototypes of the concept of a carbon fiber bow that he had accumulated over time and would put in the box. And over time, he, did, he enlisted other engineers. He enlisted an engineer from 3M, he enlisted an engineer from uh, um, Boeing. And this box accumulated stuff. Well, when Stan retired at age 68 or whatever it was, he didn't know what to do with this box, so he gave it to one of the engineers out in Seattle at, at the Boeing plant, um, who was soon to retire and wanted to play with this idea himself. And his name was Hammond Ashley, and Hammond Ashley was also a hobby instrument maker, so he had the joint passions of, of bows. All this to say, at one of these lunches at the acoustic stances, that green box is out in Seattle. Mr. Hashley has passed. His widow has called and said, do you want to come out and look at it to see if there's anything of interest? And Stan, I said to Stan, well, do you? And he says, well, kind of. And then he turns to me and says, do you? And I said, yeah, I'll go out with you. So out we went to Seattle. We spent a morning looking in this box. It was nothing exceptional. Uh, it, it was bits and pieces. In fact, I've got... This is the only sample of a bow that was in it. So now that you've had a sense of what a bow is. So we stood there at the, in the gate at the Seattle airport, waiting for our departing flight to bring us back home. And we were both kind of silent, you know, processing what we had just seen. It was, it was kind of disappointing. There wasn't more in there. And this concept that seemed to have some merit um, didn't have a lot of concrete support in this green chest. And so we're sitting there and Stan says to me, well, what do you think we should do? I said, I don't know, I'm you know, 28 years old, what do I know? <laughs> what can we do? And he said, well, we could start a business and pursue this. Well, these are the thoughts that were in my head. I have a perfectly good job. <laughs> I'm on a career path, 
I have no particular knowledge or passion of for bows or anything bow related. Um, we're contemplating a pursuit that better minds have failed at multiple times. Uh, manufacturing is just a tough business to start and grow. It's risky. Uh, and I'd been raised poor and was just digging out of student debt and I was petrified of assuming any more. I knew that starting a business meant starting more. On Stan's side, he's sitting there silently after the fact sharing with me. He's tried this before and it didn't work. Um, he was happily retired and his golf game was coming along pretty well <laughs> because he was working on it daily. Uh, he was 70 years old and just finishing his treatment for prostate cancer and had a fairly intimate relationship with death, having been uh, given his last rites five times in his life. So he wasn't sure how much longer he'd be around. And so you can imagine my surprise when I said, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and you can imagine his surprise when he said, Okay. <laughs> and so right there at departure gate four, whatever it was, we shook hands and became partners in a business that had no name and had no plan. And we remained partners for 20 years until he died. So that's one of those moments that you look back on and you say, you know, you can't explain it. You just can't explain it. Reason might say otherwise. There were others. There was Roger Zabinski, the bowmaker, world famous. Um, really had no business getting involved with us. I showed up at his door one day. It was a rainy, rainy afternoon. He lives in the cities. And I was at a loss for how to infuse <coughs> a missing something in the bow designs. We knew mechanically how they would work. They were doing pretty well, but it needed a little something else. And Roger, let me in. I knocked, and there I was with a sample, not looking much better than the one that's being passed around, and uh, some sodden papers in one hand of CAD drawings and things, and he let me in. And I said, can I share with you what I'm doing? And I'd like to know what you're doing. And we sat and we talked for a little while. And about a half hour into it, I said, Roger, it's pretty obvious to me that what you have to offer is exactly what we're missing. We have nothing to offer. We, 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 this is just getting off the ground. Um, we don't know if it'll work. And here again, Roger's looking at it saying, first of all, this looks technically otherworldly to a traditional bowmaker. Um, he says, he's thinking to himself, there's no apparent demand. Uh, if, there, if it does get off the ground, it's a threat to his business. He's a traditional bowmaker and wouldn't want this. And then who are these two guys from Winona, you know, that think somehow they're going to do it differently? Um, and then there was nothing financially. We did, at that point, we didn't have the ambition or, or we didn't have the hope uh, yet. Well, I should say we had the hope. We didn't know what the market was. We didn't know what we could do. We just had no cash. And, and Roger sat there quietly for a while, and he looked at it, and he said, I'll help you. And that was the beginning of what is now a 30-year relationship or 25-year relationship still going on today um, that has rewarded him professionally and financially and, and Cotabo far in excess of anything either of us would have expected. And it's uh, just another case that in that moment, something said to do this. And there are legions of these examples, whether it's a mold maker in Wisconsin that did the same thing in an early day um, whether it's the frog manufacturer in Germany that did the same thing, whether it's a banker who loaned us money when he really shouldn't have. <laughs> um, and it is the interns from Winona State. We, had, we were very uh, committed to <coughs> giving interns from the composites program hands-on experience to complement their academic experience. And every now and then, one would come through and it happened to coincide with an opportunity on our end. We were just too small to be able to give all of these interns. We had probably 70 of them over the course of, you know, 50. <coughs> um, and every now and then, one would say, you know what? I'm sticking around. If you've got an opportunity, I'm sticking around. I've got other opportunities out in the world that are probably better and more promising, but, you know, something tells me to stick around. There's one in the room right here. <laughs> 
That's the story of yes moments. And so as I look back, these are just a few. And you reflect back on these moments. You say something was going on there. There was a gentle nudge. There was a gentle feel um, that said, do this. Even though it may not feel prudent, it may not be sensible right now, but do this thing. And it's not about impulsiveness. It's not about recklessness. It's about feeling a nudge, a soft and gentle nudge that says, do this and good will come of it for those involved. And so I think probably a more apt name for this story and the perspective on Cotabo is the story of grace. Mm -hmm. And when I think of it like that, these moments are everywhere. They're everywhere in the Cotabo story. They're everywhere in my life. They're probably everywhere in yours. And whether it's a decision to start a business, it's a decision to get married, it's a decision to have children, it's a decision to exit a business. Um, these are all moments, these moments that are given to us by grace. And so I'm curious, have you noticed these in your own life? And upon reflection, have there been times when you felt compelled to do something that maybe didn't feel it made total sense? The feeling of being drawn to something, even if you couldn't have justified it on paper, maybe even to a friend. But there it is, and you said yes. And that made all the difference. I would love to hear your yes moments and also answer any questions. Thank you very much.